So welcome everybody, great to see you all here. Um, great to have some familiar faces and also some, some new faces as well, which is wonderful. Um, so for those of you that don't know me, uh, I'm Matthew Jaron. I'm the museum curator at the University of Dundee, and I'm also one of the events organizers for the Scottish Society for Art History, which is organizing this uh, event this evening. So it's fantastic to have uh, so many of you here. We thought it'd be nice to do um, a more kind of informal event and really kind of celebrate uh, some of the work that uh, museums have been doing uh, since uh, lockdown started. And of course, this has been a really challenging time, of course, for uh, for museums and galleries, as indeed it has been for everybody. Um, and as I'm sure you know, many museums had quite major plans for redevelopment, which have had to be put on hold. Um, other museums, and I'm sure that, that we'll be hearing from uh, Shona and Aberdeen, about this have had of course just finished a major redevelopment and then suddenly had to close again having only just reopened and of course as well as all that there's all the ongoing work that museums have, have been trying to do of, of sort of long-term exhibition planning and audience engagement and that kind of thing which of course has been really difficult uh, particularly when you're not sure exactly how when if you're able to reopen and so on so tonight we're going to be hearing from uh, staff from four of Scotland's leading uh, museums and galleries who are going to share their their current work their plans for the future and the challenges that the pandemic pandemic has brought in trying to to realize them. Okay folks so we're now going to kick off um, with our first speaker and we're delighted to welcome uh, Dr Patricia Allison uh, who is Deputy Director and Chief Curator of European and Scottish Art at the National Galleries of Scotland uh, and she's also co-director of the Celebrating Scotland's Art Project which I'm sure many of you are familiar with this it's a, a major capital project to create a whole new suite of galleries for historic Scottish art at the Scottish National Gallery so Tricia we're looking forward to hearing from you and I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much indeed. Um, well, Scottish art is one of the truly great strengths of the National Galleries of Scotland Art Collection. And Celebrating Scotland's Art, the Scottish National Gallery project, to give it the full title, aims to transform the experience of visiting this compelling part of our national heritage. Heritage was in Edinburgh, Scotland's capital city. The project has three key aims. Firstly, to reposition the Scottish National Gallery as a leading resource for the appreciation and promotion of Scottish art. Secondly, to widen the audience for Scottish art and enhance its experience, both on site and online. And thirdly, to improve the performance and resilience of the Scottish National Gallery site as a whole. Um, that's to say, to make the entire gallery site operate more effectively and to enable the historic building to cope more successfully with the challenges of the 21st century. So waterproofing, for example, is something um, that we've been considering a lot in recent uh, months. To achieve these aims, we need to make significant improvements to the site and to our visitor offer. And these include bringing the gallery spaces uh, in which we show Scottish art up to international standard. Now this is part of the gallery that's been closed for some time, but I'm sure many of you are familiar with it or were familiar with it. What was affectionately called the old B wing, B standing for basement, um, which was where uh, a large part of our fantastic Scottish collection was shown. And uh, this is a particularly poignant part of that um, gallery, which shows um, works by John Duncan, uh, Phoebe Anna Traquair, and um, uh, William McTaggart, some of our great collection highlights. So as well as bringing this area and other parts of the gallery up to, um, up to speed in a sense, up to international standards, which they were not when we closed it, uh, we also wish to increase the amount of gallery space in which we show Scottish art, as well as refurbish what we do have. So in a sense to sort of redress the balance a little bit, if I can put it that way, between our amazing international collections and our Scottish art collections. And we've also been rethinking how we present the collections so that contemporary audiences can engage more readily with them. And we undertook quite a lot of research before we closed and we've been continuing since, um, since then. Um, and this research has indicated that uh, very few of our audiences we have, or in normal uh, circumstances, we have very high uh, proportion of tourist audiences at the National Gallery particular, in particular, but um, things are obviously changed at the moment. We've got more local, but also more national audiences. And to a certain extent, uh, the story remains the same, that very few of our visitors know very much about Scottish art. And this is something that we want to sort of help with. There was also a sense very much that, that people did want to find out more and a very clear sense that we weren't really going out of our way to help them. So this is something that we want to uh, change. 
We also need to uh, radically improve the ways in which visitors get round the site. I'll maybe put that one back up. Um, if you were familiar with the gallery before, in order to get to the area, uh, one of the areas where Scottish art was shown, um, you encountered quite a lot of dead ends. You had to find the staircase, you had to go through a gallery to get there. When you were in the gallery, you couldn't therefore get to the other part um, of the lower level, new low, lower level galleries where the cafe was, where the shop was. Um, it was quite confusing and that, that was very clear that people were not only confused and lost, but very often thought the way down to the Scottish galleries was the way to the toilets, which isn't really necessarily the impression that we wanted to give. And we also want to raise the awareness of the wonderful art that is on show at the galleries. And this is, this is something that always surprises us in a way, um, but I'm sure um, many colleagues here will be familiar with that, that we have, have often had more money to promote temporary exhibitions than to promote the permanent collections. And although we have um, truly amazing things on the walls, um, on every level of the galleries. Um, it became very clear that, that many people come to the galleries have absolutely no idea what's inside. And this is something that we feel we need to address. Um, so to raise awareness before people even enter the building. So these were our aims and specific things we needed to address. What were the challenges posed by the pandemic? Perhaps I want to go to, oh, sorry, this is where we want to go to a gallery that is much more um, open, spacious, light, more space around the works, and you'll notice perhaps um, a few more modern works than we've shown before at the uh, National Gallery. Now, here I'm going to be completely honest that the pandem pandemic was not the first major challenge to this project. After completing a major two-stage lottery application process between 2014 and 2016, Having achieved a successful uh, award of planning and listed building consent, which is no mean feat, and a building warrant to start construction from the City of Edinburgh Council in 2016, and also achieving statutory consent, an act of parliament, to extend a short distance into East Princess Street Gardens. In early 2017, when we thought we would be starting, we had to pause and delay construction for a year and a half. Now, this was because the completion of the tendering process in early 2017 revealed considerably higher building costs than projected, and we had to revisit our designs. So this involved another six months work by the design team, and because we're dealing with A-listed buildings, a complete re uh, resubmission um, of application for listed and planning, uh, planning and listed building consent a combined process that added an extra 18 months to our project. The contractors started setting up their compound as soon as the building warrant came through in October 2018. But construction work proper could only start after the city's annual Christmas market, which is set up on council managed land around the gallery. That's to say in late January 2019. And I'm showing you here um, the image in the top left is the hoarding that went up after the Christmas market went down, um, which protected the mound area when we started doing some pretty hefty um, construction or deconstruction work at the beginning of the project. This slide is also a reminder of how extensive our initial year of building work was and it was primarily outside. So there's uh, the, the project isn't just to create the new buildings, it's to um, think about the whole approach to the galleries and to the, the gardens as a whole. In early 2020, the pandemic followed a particularly memorable Christmas market. Its design team reacted to our newly constructed accessible paths by building on top of them and over the newly planted trees that had been a source of considerable public concern and debate during 2019. So this was before the pandemic. What particular challenges were presented in 2020 by that? I'll put up a slightly different slide. Well, on the building site, as elsewhere, the contractors had to stop and go home. The construction site remained inactive from 9th of April to late June 2021. And as I'm sure fellow uh, speakers will agree, halting construction work is clearly not desirable when a major capital project is already underway. Before the contractors returned, new socially distant work methods had to be devised and instigated, and the council's permission had to be sought again to increase the size of the construction compound for the additional welfare facilities that were necessary for staff. 
And when work did restart within the building site, it was with a smaller team initially, and infection has been a continual threat to continuity. Now, as you'll know, with, with, with uh, particularly working with a, a contractor that has many different uh, projects under, on, uh, underway, when there are different parts of the building project, different specialists come in, and those specialists are moving all around the country. And we did find um, that it was quite often the specialist uh, was the one that contracted um, uh, COVID. So we had quite that sort of interesting dynamic, human dynamic, which affected building activity. Um, but we've, we've managed that, I think, pretty well. Behind the scenes at National Galleries of Scotland, um, design work continued throughout the period. And we worked with the contractors and we, we put extra resource into this to progress such work so that we could get to the front of the queue for building supplies when things restarted because we knew we've got an extremely good project manager and um, we knew that uh, everyone was stopped at the same time and when we got going again we would all be chasing um, supplies and it's incredibly important um, to get them going so key supplies key materials such as steel insulation skips weirdly we had been doing a lot of um, demolition work inside the structure uh, just after uh, during and just after the lockdown and um, it proved extremely difficult to get the rubble away and when you're in a city centre site you haven't got a lot of space to store rubble so that was an interesting uh, one all National Galleries of Scotland's back of house staff, as we became labelled, such as myself, were sent home, and a relatively high proportion of curators and learning colleagues were furloughed, including the whole dedicated SNG project team, apart from the digital producer, myself, and our project manager. The National Galleries of Scotland as a whole focused very, very intensely on business continuity and reopening the gallery safely. And we did, for example, we have a big international um, lending uh, reach and we had a, quite a lot of artworks out around the world which had to um, be brought back and that there was a lot of work um, in that uh, type of activity. So from April 2020 onwards, most non-construction work on the project effectively paused. Research and display preparation work restarted in January 2021. We were all working a little bit on it, but we've really sort of picked up again from January 2021. And I have to say, we have a fantastic group of colleagues working on this project, several of whom have been employed specifically to do so. Two of them are in Orkney tonight, speaking at the Peer Arts Centre on the subject of the Scottish National Gallery and the pandemic. The pace and effectiveness of our work has been hamstrung by homeworking, however. We've also been unable to, to uh, meet together, which is one of the most enjoyable aspects of project work. And it's, it's not the same on Zoom or Teams as we use. Um, it's, you don't spark ideas of, of, of each other. It's, the social aspect of it is very different. So in a sense, one of the most enjoyable aspects of working on this type of thing has, has not been um, at its full over the last year. And we still do not have full access to our archives and libraries. But it's not all doom and gloom like the daffodils that I hope you can just see in the builder's compound in East Princess Street Gardens here in the spring of 2021, we've become rather resilient in this project. And I'd like to end by just highlighting some of the silver lining, I see it, that's come out of all of this. Over the past two years, our design team's virtual visualizations, and I show you one here that's in the top left-hand uh, corner, our design team's virtual visualizations again and again have become a tangible reality. And um, if you can see the, the terrace that's in the top right, this is very much part, it looks exactly like our um, very beautiful designs that we submitted when we, we put in our planning pack twice um, in previous years. The new accessible paths and landscaping are now in place and they provide an accessible approach down into Princess, East Princess Street Gardens, which was not accessible before. And that was a problem for the council as well as for us and towards the Scottish National Gallery. And many, many folk are using this as a key feature. If you go uh, into the centre of Edinburgh, you can see the elegant stone terrace is also now a physical reality and visitors to the gardens have a range of new places to dwell and enjoy this pleasant green space in the busy city centre. 
and lockdown and social distancing has resulted in those new outdoor facilities being very much frequented. In a sense, we've got much higher traffic in this area than we expected, which in a sense is, is like the National Trust has been finding, is presenting its own issues. And I show you an image there for during the early part of lockdown, the, the Princess Street Gardens were closed while the gardens were being um, redeveloped, shall I say, after the Christmas market. So for a long time, people weren't given access, but they're very much um, a part of the, the gardens now. And with a lot of us working at home, these changes have been more noticeable and increasingly noticeable each time we go on site because we're not there all the time. And this transition from design to reality augurs well, I think, for the internal part of the project. Now, behind the contractors' hoardings, work has continued steadily on the new gallery spaces since July 2020. And it was a bit frustrating earlier that those of us who had been used to seeing it were not allowed on site as part of the social distancing regulations. So there was a huge difference when I went back in July 2021, because it'd been almost a year since I'd, in fact, more than a year since I'd been on, on site, actually within the um, construction area. We've also taken advantage of the gallery's closure to un undertake certain necessary aspects of work, such as a lot of noisy demolition and the removal of the inner box in the foyer that you might be familiar at mound level, which impeded access to the building. Um, and I'm showing you an image at the top from um, the time of Timothy Clifford when the gallery was redeveloped in the late 80s. And below, they're not beautiful images because they were during the, the, the closure period, but just to, to show you the removal of the box that's there in the top um, right. And in one of the large empty galleries in the Royal Scottish Academy building, we've undertaken a major consult conservation project that needed space and we didn't have space to do it before for celebrating Scotland's art. And that's the restoration, the conservation project of Robert Scott Lauder's Christ Teach of Humility, a painting of, 1940, of 1847. And a film has just gone on YouTube about this, um, which um, uh, is, um, I think it's, it, it, it helps to explain very technical conservation techniques in a very accessible way to Leslie Stevenson. Away from the construction site, uh, once back in action, our learning and digital teams implemented an extensive program of audience engagement initiatives, maximizing the opportunities offered by our digital platforms to connect people with our rich holdings of historic Scottish art. And if you're not familiar with them, there is an increasing series of short films and very short animations focusing, focusing on specific works of art, which are um, really good, I think. I've not been involved in, in all of them. They're really interesting, very visual. And finally, as with many other uh, cultural institutions, the pause caused by lockdown has also given us a chance to review and reflect, especially after the tragic death of George Floyd, on the nature of our collection and the ways in which we present it, both now and in the future. Such reflection has helped to strengthen our conceptualization of our future displays. And there are other welcome um, results, in a sense, of things that had to happen during COVID and during the lockdown, during the pandemic. It's given us a rare and very welcome opportunity to gather feedback because we had to instigate a new online booking system, which we didn't have before because of social distancing. And this has been a revelation, um, the amount of information we've had about visitors' experiences coming around the gallery. And it's encouraged us, for example, to bring out some works that will be hanging later on, such as here, Josephine and the uh, Fortune Teller by David Wilkie of 1837, which is quite a strong picture, if I can put it that way, and to see really what people make of it. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, uh, Trisha. That was really interesting. It's great to hear about, I guess, both the expected challenges and the unexpected ones as well. I, I don't imagine anyone think, thought that the shortage of skips would be an issue. Um, um, what we'll do is we'll, we'll probably mostly um, keep questions till the end, but I see there's a question from Robin Campbell in the chat, uh, which is quite an interesting one, asking what your, your definition is of, of Scottish art for this. And of course, I noticed that, that the title very deliberately, I'm sure, is Scotland's art rather than Scottish art. So maybe you could just briefly comment about that. And that's an interesting one, actually, because when we started the project, we were focusing very on very much on the Scottish collection. And um, we've got a range of ways that we define it. But usually uh, artists who have lived, trained, born in, had a really fundamental connection with Scotland or have had an impact on, on Scottish art. Um, but um, particularly with the, the shift that I mentioned in 2017, when we had to revisit uh, the designs, um, we looked much more at the building as a whole. So in a way we're, and 
connecting all parts of the collection much more. So Scotland's art um, can, can refer to both. But from the beginning of the project, it was very much focusing on Scottish art. And the reason that was put in the title was because our digital colleagues um, said that more people searched for Scotland than for Scottish when they were looking up things on the internet. So it had a rather functional action, but it's actually been quite a useful phrase that uh, we've used again and again. But this is very much, I would say, about Scottish art. That's really interesting. That's another thing. I would never have thought about that, actually. That's really interesting. OK, thank you so much, Tricia. So we're now going to zoom from Edinburgh up to Perth. Uh, and our next speaker is JP Reid, who's the Senior New Projects Officer at Culture Perth and Kinross. And he's responsible for the development of the new galleries at Perth City Hall. So he's been based at uh, Perth Museum and Art Gallery since 2015 and has been involved in the City Hall project since 2017. So it's been a long road, but we're looking forward to hearing from you, JP, about how it's going. So we'll hand over to you. Thanks, Matthew. Hopefully you can see that. Yep. Um, Thanks very much for inviting me um, to talk a little bit about uh, Culture Perth and Kinross's response to the last 18 months. Um, I'm going to look a little bit of how um, 2020 and the first half of this year has impacted our long term exhibition planning. Um, and then I'm also going to look at how it's uh, impacted some of our capital developments. <laughs> So, spring 2020, um, just to give you a little bit of uh, context about um, Culture Perth and Gin Ross, um, we are an arm's length charitable trust, uh, previously part of Perth and Ross Council, um, responsible for um, caring for uh, a collection of about 440,000 objects uh, covering fine art, deck art world cultures, archaeology, social history, natural history. We operate uh, three museum and gallery venues in Perth and Pinross. Um, the principal one being Perth Museum and Art Gallery, which is the white classical rotunda that you can see there. Um, the Ferguson Gallery, which houses the works of um, the colorist John Duncan Ferguson um, alongside um, work uh, and collections um, attached to his partner, the pioneering dancer, Margaret Morris, um, and a small um, folk museum uh, in Strathmore at Ailith. We run uh, a program across, a, a temporary exhibition program across the three venues. Um, and in spring 2020, we were programmed to the end of this year, the end of 2021. Um, the, highlight of the 2021 program was um, a major um, loan heavy uh, exhibition celebrating the centenary of the birth of Joan Erdley. Um, and um, I'll focus on, on how COVID impacted our planning um, and delivery for that project. Um, Aside from operating the temporary exhibition program and uh, associated public programming and collections care, um, we're also uh, involved in three uh, capital projects, all of which were quite severely impacted by COVID. Um, these comprise the redevelopment of Perth City Hall um, into a, um, a new museum, um, the refurbishment of uh, the existing Perth Museum into a dedicated art gallery um, and the development of a new dedicated collection store. So spring 2020 happened and everything changed um, and our 2020 programme was effectively ripped up. Um, we were we had planned a, a mix of uh, touring exhibitions, um, in-house generated uh, displays, uh, relying predominantly on the the uh, permanent collection, and some loan heavy exhibitions uh, like the early exhibition. Um, although um, in March 2020, when we went into our first lockdown. Early was more than a year away. We, the original slot for, for the early exhibition was May 2021 to coincide with, um, with her birthday, the centenary of her birthday. Um, the intervening um, months of 
um, furlough, uh, staff redeployment, um, intermittent reopening, restricted access has meant that um, what seemed in spring 2020 like um, a, a possibility that Erdley would be moved became a, 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 a definite reality by um, by the latter by autumn 2020. Um, this saw uh, a significant process of uh, negotiation um, with lenders, um, lenders across um, multiple venues and across the UK who were um, also dealing with their respective access um, restrictions um, and uh, in some instances furlough. The, um, as, as May 2021 came closer and closer, um, our turnaround for reopening got shorter and shorter and um, basically the, the lead in for, for, for the grand reopening after uh, the second lockdown in, uh, in, in, at the beginning of the year um, meant that we were looking at an extremely compressed slot um, for the early exhibition. And we had to take the, the, the decision at that point um, to move the, the exhibition to the end of the year. Um, we'd reached a point where we, um, and Matthew all know this as one of the lenders um, to that exhibition, um, we were relying so much on um, the capacity and goodwill um, of others, um, in some instances, it was completely untenable because um, there might be furlough, for example, or because um, staff couldn't access the objects to um, assess condition um, or treat them in preparation for, for uh, transport. When it came to um, redesigning that exhibition, we had to accommodate the fact that audience habits had changed. Um, the, the bottom image of that slide is, was the original design um, for the early exhibition. And um, we, we're since coming to terms with the fact that the way people are um, negotiating um, the space, um, their expectations about uh, social distancing, our obligations for their safety, um, one-way routes through galleries, all of this is completely transforming how we are designing and building ex uh, exhibitions and how um, uh, layout is impacted and how uh, the interpretation of narrative flow through the space is being um, uh, adapted. And then there's the inevitable communications roundabout where you try and publicise an exhibition and you try and ensure that you're publicizing with enough lead in time but at the same time um, buying yourself enough contingency time so that if in which we found we've had to change dates or we've had to move uh, venues um, the, that message is clear and understood by um, your, your visitors. The before I move on from Udley, I should just say that it is still uh, it is still opening in 2021, and we were really keen to have it in the centenary year. So um, that exhibition is now scheduled for uh, November um, to open in November. Um, aside from the ongoing uh, temporary exhibition program at Perth Museum and and, uh, and Ferguson. Um, We've also spent the last uh, five years um, working on the development of Perth City Hall as a, as a new museum venue. Um, this is a building that has quite a complex backstory. Um, it effectively became redundant um, as a concert hall um, and a civic hall um, when the new Perth Concert Hall opened um, about 15 years ago. And it's been through various project or proposal iteration since then. At one point it was going to be a hotel, at another point it was going to be a food hall, it was going to be demolished um, and from 2017 um, we've been developing it, uh, we're de developing designs 
and for it to be a museum, a museum which um, tells the story of uh, medieval uh, uh, Perth as a major early medieval um, centre um, and the broader story of Perth and Kinross um, from the Mesolithic uh, to the present day, relying heavily on our um, social history um, and archaeology collections, but drawing an interdisciplinary approach um, uh, from the rest of the collections. Um, by spring 2020, we were reaching the final stages of, of design. Um, the, and then everything stopped. The whole project, as far as our input was concerned, was more or less uh, suspended. Um, the principal funders uh, for the project are Perth and Kinross Council, uh, along with um, funding from uh, Holyrood and, and uh, Westminster governments through the Tay Cities deal. At um, the point of lockdown, only Perth and Kinross Council's um, funding was committed because the Tay Cities deal um, hadn't been signed. Um, for most of 2020, the Holyrood and Westminster had bigger fish to fry. And because of the resultant pressures on uh, Perth and Kinross Council's budget, uh, there was a point where the project was under threat. The announcement that the Stone of Destiny uh, would be removed, would be relocated from Edinburgh Castle um, to form the centrepiece of the new City Hall project, um, gave the whole development um, significant symbolic capital. Um, that was towards the end of 2020. Um, and uh, Tastes' deal funding was um, agreed shortly after. Um, the structure, I'm thinking about what uh, Trisha was saying about skips and materials. Um, the, the, the structure on the right that you can see in the, in the architect's render is a, is a new uh, intervention in the main hall. And we found that actually we've been quite fortunate in where the project stopped because um, we've, we've found that um, with the tail end of the design process still in train, we've been to an extent able to respond to um, the challenges around um, availability of materials and uh, increased cost. So for example, there's an ongoing conversation um, in design meetings about the material that will clad that, uh, what will eventually be a three-story um, temporary uh, set of temporary galleries. So in some ways we were quite fortunate in where the, uh, where the, the project um, was paused. Um, I'm very pleased to say that the project is now back in, back, um, in train with a new um, prospective opening date of 2024. Um, and construction starting on site in Feb, uh, uh, started on site in February. The two other strands of the project that um, I just wanted to touch on because the, the COVID has had a significant impact um, uh, are the conservation program and the engagement program, which I'll move on to. The conservation program um, is really dealing with the seven thousand, approximately seven thousand. Uh, objects from the collection which will go into the permanent galleries at the new City Hall. Um, having appointed uh, a, con uh, a conservator, the first conservator that Perth Museum has ever had, um, and having created a conservation lab um, so that we could assess and do basic treatment and cleaning in-house, lockdown of course meant that all access closed and that conservation um, program was paused. Um, that also meant that any remedial work that was going out to studios um, for more complex treatment also paused because we couldn't access the collections. Any volunteering or um, student placements stopped. 
um, we started the frantic process of negotiating um, or renegotiating time, time scales with um, funders. Um, and um, uh, as you'd expect, all funders have been extremely generous and accommodating and understanding. Um, coming out the other side, we're finding that um, costs have gone up almost across the board um, and our remedial projects um, have gone up by approximately 5%. Um, that said, the conservation project is back on course and with the extended project timeline is not really a concern anymore. So that this presentation is not just a long list of grievances, um, there are some positives that have come out of um, our experience and um, we found that uh, the engagement program has uh, encapsulated a lot of a lot of those and a lot of the learning um, and new ways of working that we've developed. Um, one of the one of these is around partnerships and um, the way that we've been able to sustain partnerships um, throughout lockdown. Um, the image on the in the top right um, is um, of the uh, one of the one of the star objects in our collection, which is a, a, a Maori um, kakapo cloak, um, which is being conserved in consultation with uh, Te Papa Tongarua and the British Museum. Um, it's quite a complex project, partly because of the, um, uh, the the time difference, partly because of the um, uh, need for uh, uh, ceremonial rituals to be performed on the object before um, it moves um, uh, down to London for treatment, before it is treatment and then when it's returned. But this is a conversation that we've been able to continue having um, in lockdown because of this newfound familiarity with remote conversations and remote working. The same extends to our volunteer offer, which completely stopped um, in uh, in spring 2020, but which slowly we were able to pick up again through remote volunteering, remote upskilling, and remote training, where um, volunteers were able to do immensely valuable um, work um, from home on our collections and uh, and uh, documentation. Um, we at the point of lockdown. Uh, we had a big alarm bell on the quality, of, uh, uh, a real wake up call on the quality of our online um, collections access and our online database. And um, we've significantly expanded um, our in house capacity and ability to generate um, digital documentation and, and, uh, and content, including, including photogrammetry. Um, and um, we've also ex significantly expanded um, our in-house capacity and skill and more importantly, appetite to experiment um, on new ways of interpreting um, the collection and providing engagement opportunities um, such as interactives. Um, part, part of this has come, came about um, from the first reopening where we had to strip out all of our hands-on interactives due to um, um, san basically the, uh, the inability to adequately sanitize um, uh, hands-on content. Um, so this has meant that the team has experimented with um, motion sensor interactives and this has started us down a track where staff are much more comfortable uh, experimenting um, with new modes of interpretation um, and interaction, which formerly we would have either gone to uh, third party um, for uh, third party developer for, or we just wouldn't have done at all because of um, cost restrictions. Um, the, I'll just end with the uh, the image on the bottom right, which is um, 
uh, of Richie, our, our digital transformation coordinator. Um, this was taken yesterday in the, in, in the gallery. Um, we're currently installing a Romans exhibition. And what you can see is a, a 3D printed map of um, the area around Perth. You see the Teus tree there, um, which is projection mapped with um, uh, animated uh, content exploring um, the Roman sites and Iron Age uh, sites in Perth and Kinross. This, that's been developed um, entirely in-house. We would never have dreamt of um, doing this kind of project um, uh, beforehand. We, wouldn't, we, we would have never gone to a third party to do this project before because it was so far beyond our budget. But um, I feel that at, coming out of the other end, um, there is an appetite um, for experimentation uh, which is really exciting. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's really interesting. <laughs> right, so our next speaker is Shona Elliott, uh, who works for Aberdeen Archives Gallery and Museums. Uh, she's the lead curator for Collections Access, um, and she's responsible for collections management, uh, including coordinating large-scale moves of their museum items, including, of course, the decant and return to the magnificently redeveloped Aberdeen Art Gallery. So Shona, we're looking forward to hearing from you. I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Matthew. So I'll just start sharing my presentation. Okay, so Aberdeen Archives Gallery and Museums is part of the Aberdeen City Council. We care for around 200,000 historic items and artworks, and we have several museum sites across the city centre. We have the Tolbooth Museum, which is a 17th century jail. We have a lovely historic house called uh, Provost Skeen's House. We have a maritime museum and we also have the Art Gallery. So today I'm going to talk about what we've been doing for the last 18 months, um, covering things that one went well and also some challenges. And my focus will be on the Art Gallery. So this presentation will talk about some of the activities while we were closed, but also we have managed to be open at various points. So we're covering physical and online we're fortunate to care for works by important Scottish artists, designers and makers such as Henry Rayburn, Joan Eardley, Samuel Peplow and Bill Gibb, as well as nationally and internationally acclaimed artists, including Barbara Hepworth, Francis Bacon, Tracy Emin and Claude Monet. We closed back in 2015 to enable us to redevelop the art gallery so that we would be able to showcase more works, improve access and preserve the deteriorating building. This involved decanting all collections, adding an extra floor uh, to the site and also creating completely new exhibitions. So it was a really large project for us. The redeveloped building opened to the public in November 2019. It dramatically increased the amount of display space going from 11 to 19 gallery areas with a further three galleries presenting a programme of regularly changing special exhibitions. We also redeveloped the adjacent Remembrance Hall and Cowdery Hall, the latter being our music venue. We're now displaying triple the amount of items from our permanent collection than we used to. The redevelopment has been a big success and we've won many awards for it, including Museum of the Year 2020 and various design awards. However, with the pandemic, we had to close Aberdeen Art Gallery at the end of March 2020, after only five months of being open to the public. And our engagement work shifted exclusively to online engagement and printed articles. Fortunately, we were able to reopen at the end of August 2020 after the initial COVID lockdown. However, with the rise of infections, we were required to close again in December that year, along with other Scottish venues for the second lockdown. Uh, we reopened on 26th of April this year, and we're hoping there won't be another lockdown. So last week, Aberdeen Art Gallery was officially opened by the Duke and Duchess of, of Brophsey, and members of staff, including myself, uh, enjoyed speaking with them during their visit. This official opening had been planned for early last year, but like many other plans, it had to be postponed due to the pandemic. So lockdown number one, end of March 2020 to August 2020. So my colleague Margaret Sweetnam discussed our initial lockdown engagements during a previous SSAH webinar, so I won't go over this much. 
But in brief, we gathered our various online resources into one web page called Museum from Home. We made images of artworks available for use as Zoom and Teams backgrounds. You can see that on the left there. And we even, even and this was quite new for us, uh, enabled some to be ready for importing into islands in the Nintendo game Animal Crossing. And we're quite interested with this bridge with, with, with video games. Social media was an important part of keeping the conversation going while the doors were closed. And we kept it light, linking home themed artworks and domestic items to our pandemic lives at home. We participated in Twitter hashtag campaigns and we had social media takeovers. We wrote blogs and newspaper articles and we embraced Smartify, creating virtual tours of our sites. And you can just see a snip from uh, just the, one of our web pages showing Smartify and, and extracts of our talks that you can listen to online. Our music performances, like everything else, went online with musicians recording from their homes. Extensive preparation was undertaken during the summer of 2020 to enable us to reopen in August. Building inspections and lots of risk assessments were undertaken prior to staff returning. And then we set about preparing the site for visitors. Cleaners contracts were extended, PPE was purchased, and we were, we were fortunately successful in getting COVID adap adaptation funding to support the purchase of PPE and contactless donation boxes. Research had to be undertaken to make sure that cleaning products would help uh, protect against COVID, but at the same time, we didn't want to be damaging the different surfaces in the building. So there's quite a lot of, of, of prep that happened there. Our exhibitions team installed signage around the art gallery to help direct and keep visitors two metres apart, as you can see from the image. And one-way routes were created in a few places. We designated maximum numbers in spaces and interactors were turned off or removed where possible. And then we opened, which was great. So we reopened in August 2020. Uh, after the local lockdown, just an extra one to kick in. We had Aberdeen went to, to lockdown again. Uh, our exhibitions schedule had to be adapted several times because of the pandemic but we were thrilled to exhibit the BP Portrait Awards and members of staff working from home recorded spotlight talks about the artworks and we were all busy having duvets over our heads so we wouldn't get lots of echoes while we did our, our recording. Uh, we also had time to install a small exhibition highlighting the, the work of All for One, which is a group of ladies who had recreated some of our artworks in spectacular style and so we could actually have a small exhibition showing the, the works that they'd done in their take on as well as, as what they'd come up with. So this could have all been quite challenging We're with curators still working from home. And we actually did, we needed to do some costume changes across the whole site uh, to help preserve the outfits. But our exhibitions team um, were fantastic. They were on site. Uh, they quickly adapted to checking and mounting costumes whilst liaising with curators via Microsoft Teams meetings. And it's not easy to work out how to be mounting these really complex outfits <laughs> uh, virtually. But yeah, it went, it worked well. We launched a COVID collecting initiative in October 2020. And you can see a, a nice image there of a strawberry and some my colleague. Uh, helping promote our new projects, giving examples of their home life during lockdown. So our COVID collecting initiative in October 2020 was an appeal to city residents to help curators build a new collection, showing how our everydays have changed during the pandemic. And uh, we promoted this scheme online. We received many offers and we just started physically taking in the items. We were delighted to hear in that month that we were joint winners of the Museum of the Year 2020. Awards and we used decided to use the prize money for two rounds of micro commissions to local artists and makers to create new works inspired by our collection. We're looking forward to sharing new works uh, towards the end of this year. And as part of the Museum of the Year celebrations, musician Evelyn Glenny and Alison Watt, the artist who you can see in the middle there, uh, compiled art inspired playlists for us that we shared online. 
Although we were open at the end of last year, we were still keen to maintain and extend our online audience. And we spent a lot of time improving our website, um, just like JP. The, the new website was launched in October 2020, and it offers greater access to and understanding of our collections. For instance, we improved our search functions, and we now have collection selections. You can see a little example over there, like summer selection and Bill Gibbs selection. Uh, we've also, uh, sorry, these selections provide links to images and records for our collection items grouped into various themes. We've also created highlights and we've attached audio to some of our records. We've added lots of online resources for school children on our website and to Google Classroom. Lockdown number two. So that's December 2020 to April 2021. So the nation went into lockdown again and we had to remain closed until 26th of April. We began running online exhibitions, showcasing our collections, starting with an exhibition to commemorate 150 years since the death of artist James Giles. Although we'd hoped to physically install it, the digital offer worked well, enabling us to provide access to images of works by Giles in our collection. Our digital exhibition also provided links to a YouTube talk about it from our lead curator of art and a series of blogs contributed by individuals with personal or interesting connections with Giles. As well as running online exhibitions, we began hosting online talks, beginning with interviews with the BP portrait artists. We ran a virtual symposium in March this year in, in collaboration with Grace School of Art, uh, focusing on the fashion designer Bill Gibb. It was a larger undertaking, uh, but the event was well attended and a big success, attracting people from really, uh, far, far, across, uh, far field places. And we had a variety of presenters and also interviews with Bill Gibbs' sisters. And finally, uh, moving on to the 27th of April onwards, we, we're back open again and have been since, since April. And we have a new addition to the gallery, a shop at the top on the top floor, as the name suggests. The latest edition promotes and supports the work of artists, designers and makers living and working in AB postcode areas. The shop features three to four makers at a time uh, on a three month rotation uh, who each then nominate a maker for the next slot. And it's proving really popular with the visitors. Uh, it's lovely to be supporting local creators. We successfully hosted the British Art Show 9 from July, and this has helped attract people back to our site. Uh, we also ran a second round of micro commissions. So you can see a photo of, of uh, one of the awardees. Even though we've been open since April, we've continued to run online events. So, for instance, one of our decorative art curators teamed up with a specialist to run an event in July called Feasting, a virtual aroma tour. So online attendees, and I, I participated in this and had great fun, uh, we received scent sticks in the post and sniffed them during the session while learning about our feasting exhibition at the art gallery, which is full of teapots and you know, various dinnerware and um, food containers. So we were sniffing you know, uh, sticks that smell like chicken and things like that. And we've also just experimented with a cook along session where attendees made food during a Zoom meeting whilst learning about some British artwork, uh, British art show works that have been paired with the, the meals that we were making. So it's been an interesting 18 months, full of challenges, but also full of opportunities. Many of us have acquired new digital skills. While she can't beat the experience of seeing artwork in person, the online, the online world provides so many other ways to engage with and learn about art. For instance, our online exhibition about Joan Eardley at the moment, if you just, but just from visiting one web page, you can access recorded talks, a blog and digital records for her artworks in our collections. So what we'd really like to do now is a chunk of evaluation about the success of our various online engagement initiatives. We'd like to continue expanding our digital offer and such evaluation will point us in the right direction. Usage stats are great. They're a good starting point, but qualitative research will also be beneficial. 
the challenge for us now is going to be balancing our online offers with our physical ones. Uh, we'll be considering how many online exhibitions we should do and how free, how frequently we'll be considering how often we should run online events and whether the focus should be on in-person events or even hybrid ones but that's the end of my talk but just one thing to say if you haven't been to see the British Art Show yet it's not too late but the site the exhibition does close on the 10th of October. Admission to the art gallery is free and you don't need to book in advance. You can just walk in. Back to you, Matthew. Thank you so much. Great. That's amazing to see all the really imaginative things that you've been doing. It's wonderful. I love the way you just casually name drop the Duke and Duchess to Ron Rossi there. <laughs> <laughs> OK, we're going to move on to our final uh, speaker and we're heading to Paisley and we have a slight change to the, the, the build programme. Originally, Neil Bristow was going to give this talk, but sadly he couldn't be here today. But we're delighted that at very short notice, uh, Laura Hamilton kindly agreed to step into the breach. Uh, and so she, she's going to be uh, speaking to us this evening. So Laura is the creative learning worker at Paisley Museum, part of uh, Renfrewshire Leisure. And the museum, as you may know, is currently undergoing a big HLF funded capital project called Paisley Reimagined. And Laura's main focus is helping with the coordination, co-creation and delivery of cultural and learning experiences and activities for both informal and formal audiences. So Laura, we're looking forward to hearing from you and I'll hand over to you. Hi uh, everyone, thanks so much for inviting me along and please bear with me and again sincere apologies that uh, Neil Bristol couldn't make it this evening. Um, so I'm hoping that everybody can see my slides okay and um, yep. hope they've loaded up all right. And we'll really, I uh, suppose, we'd already closed. Uh, this was the challenges of engaging audiences during lockdown and beyond. Um, so just to give everybody a little bit of background, uh, Paisley Museum had actually closed uh, in 2018. And it's part of a Paisley Reimagine project, which is a 42 million pound um, project which is being funded by Heritage Lottery Fund um, and also Renfrewshire Council. And it's we've appointed ALA architects uh, who have been creating a really exciting new vision for the museum and really redesigning uh, and creating new spaces and reinterpreting some of the existing spaces. Um, the image that you can see here on the left is part of our new extension uh, to the main Victorian gallery. Um, and this will be a glass uh, extension replacing the previous 70s block. Um, part of the Paisley Museum Reimagined Campus is also our observatory and it also includes the Heritage Centre. We're also um, going to be moving uh, into what was previously the Paisley Library space um, and the library is actually moving further down the high street into a new location. So we're actually almost doubling uh, our exhibition space that we've previously had. One of the main aims um, of our Paisley Reimagine project is really to not only um, enhance uh, accessibility, improve uh, particularly our entrance. Uh, we're going to have a new entrance to Paisley Museum, um, which is going to be on a flat level, uh, whereas previously uh, there was a lot of accessibility issues um, due to the Paisley Museum Victorian building. Uh, we had very large steps at the front. We are also doubling uh, the exhibition space and really uh, reinterpreting uh, the stories and the objects that we have on display uh, with audiences at the heart um, of all of our displays. So we actually officially closed, as I was saying, in September 2018, um, and that allowed the beginning of our construction programme to begin. Uh, we actually decanted all of our objects uh, into our new uh, publicly accessible uh, Paisley the Secret Collection store on Paisley High Street. Uh, the picture at the left uh, top hand side there is actually half of uh, the Golden City uh, painting uh, by Stephen Campbell uh, being decanted into our new art store inside our new uh, publicly accessible um, collection store. And we from the closure of the museum, we did still um, have a limited, uh, but we did still have a public programme uh, ongoing, uh, which included uh, 
school visits, uh, community group visits, and a regular program of tours to our secret collection. So although we could no longer showcase uh, exhibitions such as Ages of Wonder or the Lego exhibition or the May Toys Be With You, we could still offer a limited public engagement program. And we found it in December 2019 that the National Lottery Charity Fund approved our stage two funding, which is brilliant. And uh, in March 2020, we were all preparing to deliver our activity plan program, which was predominantly face-to-face -face, uh, activities and events that were going to be taking place um, within a secret collection and also in our other venues across Venture Leisure. So unfortunately, uh, the pandemic hit in March 2020, and unfortunately, we immediately had to close uh, the secret collection. Uh, as I say, the museum was already uh, closed. We had to close our heritage centre, which had temporarily um, been opened in one of our other venues at Abbey Mill that was closed. Um, all staff immediately had to work from home. And all of our face-to-face -face events, all of our school programmes uh, and community events that we'd planned uh, immediately had to be paused uh, while we were reconfiguring um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So predominantly initially, uh, when we all started working from home, um, most of our staff uh, began sort of really focusing on story research and content development for the new museum and the new museum displays. One of our main challenges was really maintaining that connection with our audiences and communities, which had actually already been quite challenging as part of a capital project without having our main museum venue still keeping that connection with all of our audiences. Um, so that, that challenge uh, was really multiplied during the pandemic. Um, however, it did really give us an opportunity to consider actually how can we help our audiences our communities and our schools that we were emailing and, and talking to virtually through Microsoft Teams so we took a step back on the activity plan and over the summer of 2020 um, we began embarking on a community-wide listening exercise so this listening exercise involved us talking to around 66 different organisations across Renfrewshire, and that was Renfrewshire Council partners such as um, social work, we had children's services, we had local history community groups, we also had charities such as Bernardo's who were really kind enough to give us uh, our time on Zoom meetings and Microsoft Teams for us to really listen to them and find out what their key priorities were and what were their expectations of the new Paisley Museum. And so seven themes emerged from all of these conversations which took place. Um, the seven themes were community health and wellbeing, confidence, belonging, feeling of ownership, tackling social isolation, employability and skills development, local history and heritage, creativity, play and literacy, and young people empowerment. And we really wanted to keep all of the sort of meaningful um, and beneficial work that we had been working on as part of the activity plan for our audiences and really increase um, our audiences to include new and newly vulnerable audiences um, that we were discovering through these conversations. And so we decided to almost uh, take a brand new look at the activity plan and completely review and reshape it and change uh, quite a lot of the activities and the events that we had planned. And the, at the core of this was really actually co-developing and co-creating this activity plan with the organisations and the charities and the community groups that we had spoken to. And really, how can we develop this new public engagement programme together over the course of the next year or two? And so another uh, big element of what we were working on and another huge challenge for us uh, was really how could we keep engaging with our audiences during the pandemic? Prior to the pandemic, we really uh, did have very, very limited 
um, experience of working virtually and getting remote, um, for example, conferences or even Microsoft Teams uh, didn't exist for us prior uh, to COVID-19. However, um, with huge praise uh, to Renfrewshire Council and Renfrewshire Leisure, uh, in the March 2020, uh, they initiated uh, Microsoft Teams across all of the council and Renfrewshire Leisure, which we were really thankful of. Um, and it became one of the core ways in which we could actually keep communication between all of our community groups and our audiences. And we really built our social media. Um, we had, hadn't really engaged much with social media before. We did have a Paisley Museum Twitter and Facebook account, but we really developed uh, a lot of our programs and our connections with audiences by using social media and creating new opportunities for sharing some of our amazing collections that we have online. For example, we have all of our oil paintings, um, which have fantastic photographs of, that are actually uh, online as part of the RUK.org website, which you can search. Um, we really try to make sure that this was advertised um, to all of our audiences during the lockdown. So the lockdown also gave us new ways to really uh, work quite closely with some of our community groups and in depth in ways that we've never done before, such as collaborating on some of our annual exhibitions, such as our Inspired Children's Exhibition, which would usually be on display face to face. And even when the museum was closed, we had used one of our local centres to display the exhibition. This became an online exhibition showcasing artwork from children from all across Austin for sure. Um, we also work with one of our community groups called the School of African Cultures, supported by the Patch Do Charity, and we created the Museum of Me online exhibition where the children explored their identity as Scottish and African children and what it means to them to be living in Scotland today. Another aspect of our online programme was the Heritage on Your Doorstep project, uh, which is still ongoing, and that includes developing walking tours, such as our recently launched Freddie Douglas walking tour around Paisley. And we're going to be releasing more walking tours over the next few months. It also gave us a huge opportunity to develop new skills among staff, and I include myself when I say that. Um, as I've mentioned previously, uh, we didn't have much of a digital offer prior to COVID-19, and we were able to really develop staff skills um, using Zoom, using Microsoft Teams, also uh, creating 3D models for some of our collections using some of the 3D software that we were able to acquire, creating videos, um, a whole host of brand new digital uh, skills that we had never been able to develop before um, had we not all had this time during lockdown. We were also able to develop new ways of delivering volunteering. Um, previously, all of our volunteering and our work experience opportunities had been face-to-face, -face, partnered up with our education team and curators. Um, we were able to take a step back and rethink and redevelop some of our opportunities um, and create online and virtual opportunities um, including helping us co-create and develop our stories, um, which include the collections that we're going to be displaying in a new museum. And so the challenges and next steps. So we are having uh, quite a challenge at the moment of reopening our secret collection and the Heritage Centre to the public. Uh, Paisley, the Secret Collection Centre, is actually uh, based in a basement location and unfortunately there are no windows um, and very limited access. Um, there is also limited space within the Secret Collection as all of our objects from Paisley Museum are currently stored there and so social distancing um, has really been uh, an issue uh, for reopening the Secret Collection as well as air ventilation. So we've had to make a lot of risk assessments um, about the secret collection and at the moment only a very small number of staff can actually access uh, the secret collection. 
So we really had to rethink about how we can open up access virtually to the secret collection. And we're in uh, the process of creating virtual tours for the secret collection so that the public can actually see some of our amazing collections in each of our storerooms. Um, Paisley Museum has a huge range of collections from natural history, um, from art such as uh, paintings by John Byrne, uh, drawings by Joan Airdley, um, Stephen Campbell. We have a really fantastic art collection that we're really eager to showcase to the public, especially while we're closed. So one of the other issues that we've also faced is, and quite understandably, um, many of our audiences are very cautious um, about coming into our new venues. And although we were able to open up our heritage centre based in the Abbey Mill in Paisley for research reasons, for visitors to come in um, on an appointment basis and um, to research the family history, um, we, we have really realised that audiences are quite cautious, quite rightly, about coming into these new venues, um, which is made even more difficult um, by the current COVID-19 limitations and also restrictions on space. So we're working very small steps forward. Um, we are really focusing on our co-production work, um, and that is working with the 66 organisations as part of the listening um, exercise that we undertook during 2020 to actually co-create um, and really build upon the work uh, that we had started and that's designing our public programs so that the events and the activities that we want to run when Paisley Museum reopens in 2023, over the course of the next two years, we're hoping to trial out these activities and events in venues across Renfrewshire. And the pandemic has really made us consider how we use our venues across Renfrewshire and Renfrewshire Leisure. Um, during the summer, we were able to trial out some of our activities uh, with school children uh, in some of the local sports fields. Um, so actually thinking about how we use our spaces differently and a face-to-face -face inside the secret collection is impossible. How can we bring our collections and our collections knowledge and excitement of all of the exciting things that are happening at the Museum out into the community, whether that's using some of our new sports centres, some of our new sports um, centres pitches, such as football pitches, and also uh, in some of our library spaces and other uh, community spaces throughout Bainfisher. Um, also really thinking about how we develop upon our online and physical face-to-face program and developing a hybrid model um, so that we're really meeting audiences where they are. If audiences feel more comfortable meeting us online, that we can make sure that we can facilitate that as well as us being able to bring the museum out into the community and meet people where it's easiest for them. We are also continuing to develop our audience research um, and public engagement and stakeholder involvement in preparation for our reopening in 2023. Um, for most uh, of last year, um, if anybody was in Paisley, uh, people might have wondered what was happening um, with the Paisley Museum Reimagined project. However, I'm really excited to say uh, that the builders have been on site over the past month and progress on the internal structure of the building is, is really starting to begin and is very exciting. And this on the right hand side, this image here, is an artist's impression of the new front entrance level access entrance to Paisley Museum, which is just now going to be at the left hand side of the Paisley Museum building. So that, that red turret that you see will be the new entrance and the, the glass um, structure that's next to it is the new glass extension. We will also have a new cafe in the museum which we never had before and apologies uh, I realise on the screen it uh, was slightly being cut off um, just to the top left hand side is our observatory so you're able to access our observatory much clearer um, from the Daisley Museum as well as a brand new garden which will also just be beyond uh, our glass structure. Um, 
Um, so it's really exciting. Um, the previous uh, Paisley Museum building, if, if any of you visited it, you might remember it was um, a Victorian building with a uh, stone uh, stairs, um, which was the main front entrance. Um, you can, it's not included in this picture, but they're just at the right hand side. Uh, they will still uh, be there, but this new front entrance will make access to the museum so much easier. Um, part of ALA's designs are also um, lowering and raising some of the floors um, to make access around each of the exhibition spaces so much easier. We're also going to be including uh, new lists. Uh, in the museum uh, to improve access between each of the levels, as well as building into the library space, which is a brand new space for us that we have never never accessed before, and we'll be doubling uh, our exhibition space, which is really exciting. Um, so I think that's, that's the end of my presentation. Um, please do let me know if you have any questions. Thank you very much indeed. That's great. Right, so I'm conscious that we're running a bit behind schedule. So what I'm going to do maybe is just take the opportunity to ask one question of each of our uh, speakers um, before we finish. So uh, what I'd like to know is um, if you could maybe all think of one object or artwork that is uh, has gone on display in, or, or will be going on display in your redevelopment that maybe you haven't had the chance to show before or hasn't been on display for ages that you think is is a real sort of standout of your your redevelopment. So uh, Tricia, maybe start with you. For me, it has to be Robert Scott Lauder's Christ Teach It Through Humility. Uh, we have got some wonderful pictures by Robert Scott Lauder, but this is a, a painting that has intrigued me. Um, it's, it's been in our companion guide. Um, it's or It was on Helen Smale's, my colleague's list of top Scottish works, but this particular painting had been in um, closed access really in, in a care home in East Lothian since the mid 80s and before that I can't trace exactly but I don't think it was rehung after the Second World War when things were taken away. Amazingly interesting picture and the first modern Scottish artwork that was bought for the, Nash, the new gallery so it was a real triumph in a way. Um, being able to do a big conservation project. Colleagues will know conservation is, is wonderful, but it's not easy to do. So that for me has to be the great. And kind of, I could just say that it was one of these Victorian artworks that had been separated from its frame. The frame had been created when the building was put into the new gallery. That frame was thought to be lost, but as part of the research project, we found it and it's being restored. So it's a whole big project and it's very exciting. Brilliant. Excellent. Yeah, I think um, Lauder is definitely an artist that deserves to be better known. I mean, he should be much more better known than I think he is. Um, JP, I'm, I'm guessing you're probably going to say the Stone of Destiny, so maybe I should force you to choose something else. <laughs> I, I wasn't, actually. Ah. Um, and, uh, uh, I'm slightly self-conscious about my favourite object in the permanent displays at City Hall because um, it's, uh, it's a, a, lure, a purple Eurex disco bodysuit from the 1970s that was worn to a Christmas party at the Wheel Inn in Schoon in 1971. And I just, I think, I love this object. I love the fact that, that these objects can be elevated. These pieces of social history can be elevated alongside, you know, the Stone of Destiny or, you know, a Pictish carved cross or a Bronze Age log boat. Um, I, I love the fact that, that, you know, we're able to do that. Um, and um, yeah, so that's my, I hope I'm disappointed. <laughs> not at all, not at all. Are you going to be modelling it at the opening? Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay, Shona. So one of my favourite artworks is Trezian by Barbara Hepworth. It's this huge bronze sculpture. Now we did have it on show prior to the redevelopment, but it used to be on the ground floor uh, 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 with a fountain arrangement, so it was sitting uh, in water. But we've changed that setting, and I think it's really, you see it in a completely new light. We now have it outside on a roof terrace. Uh, it's a real draw point, as well as seeing the, the, the nice views of Aberdeen. You're going out and you're seeing a sculpture, and so you've got all the different levels of, of light on it, and it's so even though people have seen it before, you can now see it in a new light. Well, lots of new new lights. Brilliant. Excellent. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to coming up to visit. Um, and finally, Laura. 
think selfishly, I'm probably going to have to choose the the Golden City painting um, by Stephen Campbell because I know it wasn't very clear in that image that I showed, but that was only half of it. The sheer scale of the painting is incredible. And previously, we were only ever able to display it in the Paisley Museum Exhibition Galleries a handful of times just because the scale of the painting and, and the weight of the painting um, on the wall. So I'm really excited that it's, it's actually going to be on display um, in all its glory in the new museum. And, and at the moment, um, it's, it's in our secret collection and it's actually, it's, it's one side is on one half of the art store racks and one side is on the other half. And you can only see it fully if you, if you open both of the racks together and even then some some of the, the painting is still obscured so I'm actually quite excited about seeing the real painting put together again in 2023. So how many people does it take to move it? I, believe it or not it took eight people to, to move it out of the Paisley Museum out of the, the store in the Paisley Museum and actually bring it down the stairs um, and it took several hours um, it, Paisley Museum is, is if you were to walk it it's only about an eight minute walk from the museum down the high street to the store but it actually took several hours to get it physically out of the museum down uh, two sets of different stone stairs inside and outside the museum it, and then loaded safely into the truck before being transported around uh, to the new secret collection so it, it was quite a feat I, I just watched uh, the, our technical team uh, did all the hard work. Brilliant. Excellent. Well, uh, definitely looking forward to seeing that. Uh, so I'm aware that there are some other comments in the chat, but uh, I'm also aware that we're rather late finishing. So we do want to draw things to a close. I'm sure you're all desperate to go home and get your tea. Well, you probably are home, but you can immediately go home and get your tea. Uh, so just a big thanks to all of our speakers. I think you'll agree it's been a really fantastic evening and, and you know, just a, a testament, I think, to the, the, the amazing talent and determination and inspiration and all the other things that, uh, that are going on in, in Scottish museums at the moment. Um, also want to thank Lucinda Lax, who's been sort of behind the scenes doing technical support. So thanks very much for that. Um, uh, I should put in a plug for uh, one of our upcoming SSH events uh, on the 23rd of November. Uh, we have Elizabeth Cumming giving a, a talk about Robin Philipson. So do look out for that. That's a members only event. So if you're not a member, uh, then it's a very good incentive to join. Uh, go to our website, ssh.org.uk for details on membership. Uh, so thank you all very much for coming. Great to see you all and enjoy the rest of your evening. Cheerio, everybody.